But in this country, 330 million people, which is remaking itself every decade, if we don't somehow address the failure manifest by these kinds of violent and antisocial behaviors that are pathological, I repeat myself, I'm not afraid to say it. Cancel me if you want to. But I'm going to stay in touch with reality. Oh, John McWhorter, this is Glenn Lowry. How you doing, John? Hey, Glenn, how are you? I'm getting by. Life is full of all kinds of complexities. I'm Glenn Lowry. I'm the Merton Stoltz Professor of the Social Sciences and Professor of Economics at Brown University, and I'm also the John Paulson Senior Fellow at the Manhattan Institute. I'm with John McWhorter. He teaches at Columbia University, Professor of the Humanities there, and is a weekly columnist for the New York Times and is my conversation partner here at The Glenn Show that you've tuned into The Glenn Show. Uh, every other week, uh, he and I get together and we talk about stuff that we're together here this week talking about stuff and not talking about stuff that no, no more will be said about it except I'm signaling to the world out there that I'm not talking about the stuff that you think you were going to hear me talk about. Not with me. To be me. continued, to be continued. But in any case, John, what's up, man? How you doing? <laughs> Glenn, that was <laughs> that was low. I am. Uh, <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> I am fine. Um, all sorts of things happening, but classes are over. Um, my ears are ringing this morning because of um, your friend Tucker Carlson. My friend, and this, this thing that he said. This thing about this isn't how white men fight. And so he's, you know, watching. Why don't we tell people what we're talking about here? Tucker Carlson has been exposed. This is uh, emails or texts at Fox News that were made uh, available due to discovery in the Dominion voting machine uh, libel case that they brought against Fox, which was settled for three quarters of a billion dollars. And now there's some aftermath. John, you want to tell them exactly what you're talking about? Well, there have been these tweets that we hadn't seen yet that apparently made Rupert Murdoch et al. fire Carlson rather abruptly a week ago. And apparently one of them was that in one of his, not tweets, texts to um, one of the internal texts, he, and a long one, it's clear that he's reflecting, it's probably late at night, he sees a group of white men beating up on another white boy. It's and, an Antifa person, isn't it? Uh, yeah, and yeah. It's a, is it January sixth that this is happening? I think it, I think it was, and they're, they they are white. You know, you could say in a very general way, skinheads. I doubt if that's what they were, but ones who would try to beat the hell out of an Antifa protester like that. And Carlson seems to be under the impression that that's a. I think it's safe to say it's a black way. He's not referring to Chinese people, but white people don't fight like that. There's a kind well, of. Well, he didn't a, say black. He just said white don't fight like that. Right. But there's okay. a barbarity that you wouldn't expect of white people. Who would you expect it of? And I think it's safe to say that he's thinking of probably black and Latino gangsters. And so you know, that's apparently that's just not the white way. So white people fight more politely. That's pretty. You know, I am not one to walk around calling people racist because it's fun or out of some sense that my doing so improves society because we have to identify every little smudge of it that we find. But that's a pretty that's a pretty bigoted thing to say, to imply. I mean, it basically just, you know, plays into the idea that there is a kind of violence that is for some reason or it's in some sense inherent to, yes, black people and maybe Latino people, too. He's not referring to any other people. He doesn't mean that. Jews, you know, but well, they're white, et cetera. Well, but he means let brown me, people. Let me ask you this. This so I'm gonna I'm gonna defend Tucker Carlson here. <laughs> Have fun. <laughs> I mean, he just got fired by Fox. The first thing I'd say is, isn't it interesting that we're learning about this particular message at this time? Who benefits? Well, Fox News obviously is in control of the information flow and is uh uh has has a problem of managing the uh, blowback from firing its most popular host. So uh, obviously you want to make him look bad. Secondly, there's this piling on. Your employer, the New York Times, did a major quote-unquote expose of the uh, white replacement theory, black, whatever, uh, white replacement theory um, 
conspiracy theory, racist character of Tucker Carlson's uh, uh, ratings busting program. Mm -hmm. Now I watch not religiously, but I watch on occasion. I tune in at eight o'clock to hear what the monologue is going to be from Tucker Carlson about a whole lot of range of issues from Ukraine, where he's one of the only voices in major journalism saying, is this a good thing for us to be doing? One of the only people saying, who blew up that uh, Nord Stream pipeline? Who really did blow it up? One of the only people saying, can you count the number of former CIA officials and former generals and uh, whatnot who are coming on uh, liberal uh, cable news and feeding to the American people with a spoon the propaganda of the uh, defense establishment in this country. Can you count them? He's one of the only people doing that. He had Robert F. Kennedy Jr. on his program to talk about vaccines. I know no one is supposed to credit Robert F. Kennedy Jr. When the kids riot in Chicago and they run like mobs down the middle of Michigan Avenue and Wabash Avenue and State Street, and they beat up random strangers with their fists flailing like that, the only place on national television that you're going to see any videos of these kids behaving in this way is on Tucker Carlson. Obviously, he's a racist. It's not that easy. I don't think you can dismiss Tucker Carlson. He has a huge audience. Who are those people? They're all racist. They turn in to get red meat. That is the bubble of Manhattan speaking. Uh, I ain't going there. Tucker Carlson is an important voice in American journalism. Yes, he's conservative. And yes, he's a provocateur. Yes, he is. But you can't read him out of the conversation with a, by calling him a witch. And that's what people are doing. They're calling him a witch. Well, what about the border? He's the only person, not the only one, obviously not the only one, raising the question of whether we're going to allow the future of our country to be determined by a failure to enforce our own laws. That's a fair question. You don't have to be an anti-Mexican, anti-Brown person to raise that question about our country. He's the only one saying that when a, a person shows up with a man with exaggerated breasts coming almost over his knees and is putting himself in front of children, is that what we actually want in our country? He's practically the only person who's saying that. So it's just too easy to put a hood on Tucker Carlson and shunt him off the stage without addressing any of the actual things that make him the most popular cable uh, host broadcaster in the country. I'm sorry, I'm not going to do that. So where, where the bubble is not supposed to go is that um, <laughs> where Tucker Carlson gets the idea that that kind of gang violence, that there's something black about it, and that is what he means. Where he gets that is not just out of the air. You're right. There are things that, and we don't need to see the video. You can just read about it. I personally don't watch many videos in that sense. But when you're talking about who is committing that kind of mayhem in Chicago, it's not that we're not seeing videos of white boys doing it somewhere else in town. It's, it's black guys doing it. And there are the riots that you're always referring to that happened in 2020. Some of it was white people. But in terms of the breaking the windows and stealing the TV sets, it was, it was our Omar who was doing it. And, you know, even now here in, um, here in New York, it's been found that a, a small proportion, a small number of people are responsible for all, for a, a vastly disproportionate amount of shoplifting. They totted it all up from, I believe last year. And it's really just, a, it's a few hundred people. And of course, none of the stories that I'm aware of said this, I kind of looked around, but there is a very strong brown tilt and I would venture to say from looking at names, black tilt to the people who are doing this. Some of the ringleaders, oddly enough, are East European, like they're layers of it. But in terms of who's running into Walgreens and stealing shampoo and, and razors and things, I shouldn't say razors, that ancient stereotype, but razor blades are expensive. I, I get it. If I were going to be a criminal, I would sell those out on the street. And so it's black men who are doing that. 
you cannot help seeing that as, as a sentient person. And yes, there are white people who commit crimes, but unfortunately in America's cities, in terms of homicides, for example, the number of white and Asian people who do it is absolutely infinitesimal, and black people do it a whole lot more than Latino. And he's basing it on that. But Glenn, I don't think it's as simple as that. The issue is whether or not he should therefore conclude that there is something. Well, no, let's just try this. He could know that ultimately the reason for that disproportion is something you might call structural. There's a history that makes these black men more likely to do this and still say black people do it more often and black people need to do something about it. He could say that, in which case the case for his being a racist becomes thinner. But when he puts it that way, in that shorthanded way, and maybe that's because he was being casual and wasn't thinking about being heard, but his idea that there's a white way to fight, and then there's the way that black people do it, you can't help thinking, how many hair splittings is he doing? Isn't he really, especially if you look at all the other sorts of things he said, such as the replacement, these people are going to replace us. Now, he might formally know that there's a reason these people behave this way, but then again, we're splitting hairs, it seems to me. Those people are going to take over. We white people better start tanning our testicles and you know, reproducing more because we don't want the whole country to become them. You're putting How? words in his mouth now, John. Excuse me. Come on. He never said he anything He said something like about that. tanning testicles. And the idea was to increase fertility. And so <laughs> the question is, and this is a real question, should he be allowed to say these things on television? Many people say, oh, no, 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 because that stirs up more virulent racist feelings. My question is always, if they were there to be stirred up, what is this idea that you don't say anything to stir it up as opposed to thinking what people are thinking they're going to express in some way, or even if they're not expressing it, it's still there. The work is to change how people think and frankly, for black America to look inward and to do what we can, which is never going to be everything, to get better despite the unfortunate situation. It's both government and us. But you don't think that there's anything wrong with that sentiment of his, that black men are violent and that black men are about to replace us all? That doesn't rub you the wrong way at all? Well, I, I don't know that Tucker Carlson thinks that. He might think it. If he did think it, I would disagree with him. Yes, that would rub me the wrong way. Um, I think he's, what's the claim about the replacement thing? The claim is the Democrats don't enforce the border because those are the, their voters coming over. Yeah, Latinos are going to take over. The, right. Those are their voters 10 years down the road, which may or may not be true, but that's the, that's the theory. The Democrats don't enforce the border. That's certainly true. I mean, if you want to speculate about Tucker's motives, I suppose we could speculate about the motives of the people who don't enforce the border. So now we're in the same ballgame. He's a racist or he's someone who's speculating adversely about the motives of the people who disagree with him about uh, what to do on the border. So I, I, you know, this racist thing, I like, it's not an argument. It, it's ad hominem in the extreme. It's saying bad person, bad person, bad person. When the whole currency of the realm here is not whether or not somebody is going to go to heaven, the currency of the realm here is whether or not their arguments are persuasive. So, you know, um, should he be allowed to say uh, innuendo, which is, that's not how white people fight, which is like saying, if when I see that kind of melee going on, I'm inclined to think that it's black. So I'm surprised to hear that it's not white. No, of course, that's not an artful thing to say. Uh, if I were the editor in chief or the publisher of the Oregon, I, I wouldn't have him saying that on my platform. Should he be allowed to say it? Of course, he should be allowed to say it. I mean, there shouldn't be any law against saying it. But uh, if he works for me and I control the copy that goes out on my platform, that's not what I would have said. I wouldn't have that said for the reasons that you allude to, which is that it's socially unproductive and it feeds into various stereotypes. On the other hand, I'll say this. This is an emperor has no clothes argument. Because you won't let him say it, because he forbears, you know, because he goes along with the program and we're quiet about it, doesn't mean that people can't see it. That's true. And that they don't think it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's not a straightforward problem to reckon whether suppressing a commonly held and obvious fact from overt expression kills the fact or makes it even more powerful and more dangerous. Because everybody can see... <laughs> 
what, what's going on? You say uh, I'm always referring to the riots of 2020. Well, the riots of 2020 were historic events. Uh, probably in the long run, more uh, salient in the undercurrents of American politics than the riot of January 6, 2021. Do you know how many guns people went out and acquired is in the uh, aftermath of that civil disorder? Do you know how many police unions have become stronger in their local communities because of the uh, defund the police movement and so forth and so on? Uh, do you know how many people are questioning uh, whether or not the integrity of our major institutions like our courts uh, can be relied upon when mobs form outside of courthouses, et cetera, et cetera? Um, the de-policing movement has cost probably thousands of black lives, according to some studies by re reputable people like Roland Fryer at Harvard, uh, because police have pulled back uh, in the wake of the uh, delegitimation and the wholesale attacks on, on their uh, being able to do their jobs that has flowed in the in the face of you this. mean the Ferguson effect and then Baltimore a little after that yeah yeah and, yeah and police withdrawing in effect going and strike in place because they're saying if you don't have my back I'll be damned if I stick my neck out um, anyway that's somewhat speculative but I mean I think the evidence is more than uh, casual to the effect that that has had a uh, adverse reaction in terms of public safety in in the big cities um, retail. Are you going to invest $100 million in the middle of the south side of Chicago? Uh, Ken Griffin and Citadel picked up their multi-billion dollar hedge fund empire and moved it to Miami from Chicago because their employees didn't feel safe on the streets downtown. Who are committing those crimes? Now, I think we have to get our heads out of the sand here. Race relations will not get better through denial. There's something profoundly wrong in the social fiber of a community when that kind of behavior is commonplace. Now, did it get that way because people are bad people? No. Am I uh, a racial essentialist thinking that uh, black culture is somehow fundamentally flawed? No. How did seventy and seven and ten kids born to a woman without a husband come to be through complex historical dynamics, much of which had little to do with black people or black culture per se? But nevertheless, nevertheless, the kid is 15, 16 years old. The kid has a pistol. The kid is not parented, and there's a thousand of them on the street. Now that's failure. That is a failure of the socialization of young people to the norms of civility that are essential to the preservation of our way of life. Is it their fault? I don't give a fuck whose fault it is. We are going to have to deal with the reality that this is a social dysfunction. It needs to be addressed. Now, pat formulae like, oh, there's not enough opportunity in those communities. That's what the new mayor of Chicago said. He said, I'm not going to demonize kids who are uh, deprived of opportunity in their own communities. There's not enough opportunity in the communities. There should be more opportunity. OK, I'll get on that bandwagon. Let there be more opportunity for people who are marginalized. I'm for that. Now, now that we're finished with that uh, sermon, what are you actually going to do to raise those kids? To inculcate in them orientations, patterns of behavior, values and norms expectations and the internalization of restraints that makes it possible for them to actually avail themselves of any opportunity that might otherwise be provided. What are you going to do? What are you going to do about the schools? What are you going to do about early childhood education? What are you going to do about order and law? So, so we can burn the messenger. We can shoot the messenger call him Tucker Carlson, and let's get our racist card out if we want to. But in this country, 330 million people, which is remaking itself every decade, if we don't somehow address the failure manifest by these kinds of violent and antisocial behaviors, 
that are pathological. I repeat myself. I'm not afraid to say it. Cancel me if you want to. But I'm going to stay in touch with reality. And you know, Glenn, I mean, <laughs> I'm with you. Oh, okay, I overdid that. Let me just confess. I overdid that just a, just a bit because I'm a little on edge over here these days. But to be honest, if a clip of exactly that gets out there and gets rerun over and over, it needs to, it needs to be. I agree with you. I, I feel like I'm not supposed to. It's sad hearing you say all that, though, because, and I'm going to dig myself in even further. John thinks he's so smart. He's so superior. It's not that. But I do think I have an understanding of this that seems to elude many people who are probably smarter than me, which is a lot of people are listening to you and they're going to say, there he goes criticizing black folk. There's that usage, folk, not folks, folk. It, it conveys the affection. You're criticizing black folk, folk, that. And... You're saying, no, no, there is a cocktail of socio-historical reasons that creates Omar. And we could talk about that. Right. But there's a certain kind of person who thinks that all race talk is supposed to be is endless recitation of those causes. Of course, we don't all disagree with what the causes were, but we're supposed to do this historical recitation in this religious way. And that's supposed to somehow be a response to Tucker Carlson, when the fact is, you're not criticizing black folk. You're saying that bad stuff happened, mostly from about 1960 to 1970, that end up leaving people less capable of making the best of the mediocre than they otherwise could. But that what's happening in the here and now, which is what most human beings live in, something needs to change and you can't fix what happened in 1966. You can't go back to the past and fixing it is not gonna be a matter of making people less racist, making them read their Robin D'Angelo or telling Tucker Carlson to shut up. That won't change Omar's behavior. Omar's behavior does need to change despite that the reason he acts like that is not his fault or the fault of black folk. Glenn, the sad thing is that our ideological situation is such that an awful lot of people cannot hold those two thoughts together. They are incapable of understanding that both of those things are true. I don't completely understand why, except that I think for them it's fun to resist holding those two things in their head because it's more fun to talk about racism and to hold white people to account, so to speak. But most people can't hear that. And so what I really think is that if Tucker Carl... Tucker Carlson, living in the here and now, sees the kinds of videos that you're talking about, sees the statistics, and he just starts thinking, well, you know, there's something wrong with black people. The Latino case, I think, is different in terms of people coming over the border, but for him, he, I guess he thinks of that as pathological. But there's something wrong with black people. To be perfectly honest, I think we're asking too much of society to not have thoughts like that, given these extreme contrasts in behavior between Omar and let's call the white guy Stuart. It's asking too much. I mean, put it this way. If we can't expect self-appointed race men and women to both understand that you can understand the socio-historical causes of where we are, but also say that where we are now has to change and it's not going to be a matter of just changing racism. If we can't expect people to hold those two things together in their head, we certainly cannot expect a Tucker Carlson to look at the sorts of things he's looking at and think, well, all of that is because of a socio-historical cocktail of things that happened 60 years ago. It's too much to expect. And so I get what you mean. Yeah, that telling Tucker Carlson to shut up is not the solution because I think you know, a great many Americans think like him. If they don't, often they're just pretending not to. How much do we expect of people? But the enlightened position is that we're supposed to expect much more, that everybody's supposed to think of black people only as these people whose history always matters. And we're not supposed to talk about the present except in terms of the history. And I think, um, Glenn, you're too far ahead. Most, most people can't keep those two things in their minds. Neither Donna, our character, who's mad at us because we're not talking about the history, nor Tucker Carlson, neither of them can keep those two things in their head. She can only think about 1950. He can only think about like 2015. And so, yeah, that's the problem. That's the issue. And I don't think either one of those people are going to change, which is 
a damn shame. But I hear you, Glenn. Maybe I we stuck well. I, pre- I appreciate your support. I, I thought I was going to be out there twisting in the wind all by myself. No, no. Uh, but, you know, we have an impasse here. Uh, do you think John Haidt, you know, John Haidt, uh, coddling in the American mind and mm-hmm. all that? Uh, structurally stupid, you know, how uh, collective political processes can result in bad outcomes, even, you know, the adverse effects of social media and of the mobile phone culture and whatnot. And I mean, some kind of social psychological account of why it is that we seem, many of us, unable to hold two thoughts that are not contradictory at all, but that are interestingly in tension with one another. Hold them in mind. I, I guess I think a couple of things. I mean, is it really such a bad thing to say that there's something wrong with black people? <laughs> let, me, let, let me try to defend that. No, I, what I mean is, what did Malcolm X say when he said, you've been hoodwinked, you've been bamboozled? You American Negro, what was the critique? What was the radical critique of, of, the, of the middle of the road Negro aspiration uh, civil rights, conservatism, church-based, don't, don't get too much up in their faces. It was a balled-up fist, and it was the voice of liberation, which was Black people, free yourselves from the mental encumbrances of the, you know, uh, servant mentality or slave mentality or whatever like that, and, and, and make yourselves. There was something wrong with you when you were bent in a crouch. When you stood up with your shoulders back and, and, you know, and you took responsibility for your own security, you were fixing what had been made wrong with you by the process of your own enslavement or whatever. So it's like the real issue is agency. The, the real issue is not that we're pristine and perfect and beyond the possibility of improvement or uh, without fault or, or flaw. Uh, or, or encumbrance or, or injury, the real issue is, are we or are we not the masters of our fate and the captains of our souls? Yeah. It's like, some of it is, is just how you market it, I guess, because, you know, with Malcolm X, the critique of the community was acceptable because it was coming from a, a searing hatred of whiteness and what it did. And, you know, my true sense of what happened to create Omar was that one, the countercultural attitude, which starts with whites, meant that a critical mass of especially educated and influential white people started fetishizing being against the man. And that really fed into what was going on in, for example, the black arts movement and the birth of the Black Panthers as opposed to SNCC, the, 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 um, the um so the um help me Glenn student nonviolent coordination conference or was the end something else student nonviolent that? coordinating committee coordinating committee yeah and yeah. so you switch from that to the Black Panthers all that's of a piece the reform of welfare laws to make it easier to get on and stay on welfare was led by well intentioned white people that's Francis Fox Piven and Richard Cloward I'm not trying to make them into devils the way some people have but they were responsible for this the war on drugs is one half trying to get at the hippies one half trying to get at the blacks that was straight up racism in itself that's white people and so all of that coming together during that terrible time ends up creating a situation where an Omar grows up in a community where acting like a damn fool is considered maybe not ideal but one way of being that isn't great, but you still love Omar and there are lots of other Omars and this is the way it is. And maybe it has to be this way because racism is around. And so how perfect do you expect us to be? Don't bother us with your respectability politics. That's what creates that. And it's so hard to talk about those things. How do you talk about a change in a cultural mood? It's not quantifiable. A statistician can't get at it. Larry Bobo can't, you know, find the numbers for it, and he wouldn't want to anyway. But there are changes in cultural moods. The welfare revolution is hard to cover because it was different in every city. The war on drugs is a little easier, but I think that's what happened. It's not anybody's fault, but it does mean that Omar is a mess, and it's not because society here in 2023 doesn't love him, which is unfortunately what I think a lot of people want us to say. Just not true. Is it because his dad is not home and part of the household that's uh, raising him up? 
in, in it. her. Yep. And he and dad's not around partly because of the war on drugs, partly because dad grew up in an atmosphere where being respectable held less of a pull upon fewer people than it would have in even the most depressed black communities in the past. And that's not Omar's father's fault. Omar's father's, his name is Clifford. It's not Clifford's fault. It's just, it's all he knew. Okay. Now, what about the politics? Um, by which I mean, how are we expecting to appeal to our fellow citizens who, unlike you and me, do not feel a uh, family connection to Omar? I speak for myself, but I, I dare go out on the limb and say that you, you have a certain sense of identity as a black man and the reason that you spend so much time engaging these issues in part because you care about what happens to, quote, your community, close quote. But you can obviously tell me that that's wrong if it's wrong. I but very much do. I have Omar cousins. I've seen Omar. Yeah. So what about the people who, are, who, who do not have a predisposition to sympathy for Omar? What about the people who are afraid of him? The ones that Scott Adams... People. Yeah, a lot of people and don't want to live near him, want to cross the street when they see him coming. Uh, don't want to invest if they think there's going to be too many of him hanging around. Kind of like that. Whose votes have to support any public undertaking. You know, is there a respectability politics aspect to the black community wanting to rein in the excess behavior of our youth because they are creating a circumstance in which it'll be very, very hard to persuade our fellow citizens to stay with us and invest in and stay the course on. Is there any foundation for a politics that's going to sound like apologia? I, I know that it's bad. I, I know how bad it looks, you know, the, and, and even these sermons, you know, you can give a fiery sermon like Ray Nutter, the former mayor of Pennsylvania uh, of Philadelphia did went into a church after they, you know, this is 10, 15 years ago. There were some. Michael. Yeah. Stuff that was going on, but a bunch of kids doing stuff, getting on public transit and messing with people or whatever they were doing. And, and Nutter sort of dressed down. He said, your, your parents, if you don't take responsibility for your kids, we're going to come looking for you. And we're going to lock you up or words to that effect. Um, he, he called it nonsense. He started talking about curfews and he started talking about, you know, and he was in a church and everybody was saying, amen, amen, amen. And I thought at the time, A, it's going to be just about as effective as Bill Cosby's campaign. But B, maybe his audience isn't the black community. Maybe his audience is the rest of Philadelphia. And he's trying to tell them, you know, I, I got your back. <laughs> and then I thought, would it have been crazy if that had been what was going on? Or would it have been shrewd? <laughs> and, and I know what the anti-respectability politics answer is, you know, which is those are racist. Uh, you, you're going to, uh, you know, genuflect and bend over backwards to try to look good for them when they don't give a damn about you anyway. And they all they're looking for is an excuse to turn their backs uh, and, uh, you know, stuff like that. But <laughs> some of this behavior is shameful. I, am, I, am I the only one who is ashamed of the fact that every time I turn on the television and I hear about a party gone awry and somebody pulling out a gun and shooting somebody that the, you know, nine times out of 10 or 95 times out of 100, it seems, you know, the perpetrators are black. Uh, you know, I, is, is that a real political flaw or, or is, it a, is it a virtue to have a sense of, of deference to and respect for the sensibility, the decent sensibility, not the racist sensibility, but the decent sensibility of, of your fellow citizens and, and the want to show the best face. I, I don't know. There's something someone said. Some white man of influence, maybe in sports. I think he said it in the 90s. You might be able to identify this. He said, the problem with black culture is there's no shame in failure. You remember when someone said that? No, I don't. It's, it was definitely, I'm making up the first half, but 
No Shame in Failure. We could Google whoever said it. And their career was over in a second, I seem to recall. And I remember hearing it and thinking the sad thing is that he's onto something. It's not that there's no shame. It's that there's less. There's a guiding tacit sense among a great many Black people that when it comes to Black failure, it has to be understood on some level because of the operations of structural racism. And in a way, that's almost too sophisticated. It's, it's a very host way of thinking of things because there's some truth in it. Yes, that might be true to an extent. But beyond a certain point, and that point, you know, is bypassed way too much, there is a sense that being Omar is not the best thing, but we have to understand that it's going to be a norm because racism. And that's, to decry that, to say that that's abnormal, is considered respectability politics, but I think that's just local to our moment. It's a problem. I genuinely think that it is an excess of sophistication in a way. It is a very advanced insight to say, this person failed, but you have to kind of see it as because of a very abstract but powerful structural barrier that this person dealt with. And that's why Omar is seen as, you know, to an extent, to humanize it even more, there's a bit of people who think of Omar as a soldier. The Wire was good at depicting that. Omar is at least you know, kind of girding himself up and rebelling against all this racism. At least he's not just laying down. He's doing what Malcolm X said. Omar often has a Malcolm X t-shirt. But none of this gets us anywhere is is the problem. It's too sophisticated. Uh, Let me try this on you. I'm trying to think, you know, what the other side of the argument is going to be. And why is it that a figure like, I don't know, a Tupac Shakur has the cultural resonance that he has in, in those movies he made and what the gangster rappers were saying and, and that whole genre of, of musical, uh, uh, you know, initiative, uh, thug life, the romanticization of it. Uh, all of that culture that develops around deprivation or, you know, or around marginalization, because in fact, people don't have any money. They're piled on top of each other in a housing project somewhere. Uh, the underground black economy, the drug economy, the prostitution economy, the fencing stolen goods economy, the uh, extortion economy, the, uh, you know, uh, it has insinuated itself. You'd have to be a saint or a hero to emerge from that unscathed. And there's stories in there. So, you know, take off your social science hat and put on your literary hat for a minute. And, you know, I want to hear the voice. I want to know the cry, the anguished cry. I, I, I want to see hope extinguished. I, I, I want to see tragic, the tragedy born, born on the humane, uh, platform of this life, this life that's stunted by all these forces that are out there. And that is uh, that sensibility, that awareness of the, you know, sort of human suffering and despair. You know, I'm, I'm saying all this because I'm channeling my wife, my lovely wife, Lawan, because we have this conversation all the time. And I'm like, oh, my. Omar, Omar. And she's like, (laughs) try being Omar for a minute. You know? So that could be the answer to my question of why you don't do respectability politics, because the dignity of Omar and and his ilk, uh, the humanity of them somehow gets effaced uh, if 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 you make them into nothing but a problem and, and you don't see that it could have gone a different way if there had been a big brother, if there had been a programmer and intervention, if there had been just a different roll of the dice. He didn't have to be there at that time when the guy took out the convenience store clerk. Now he's got a felony murder rap and he's up there for, 
life. Um, that, that by counting the beans, you know, how many people had fathers in the home, what was their reading score, how many days were they absent from school, you know, how many previous charges did he have for shoplifting or for assault? You know, now I've typed him. I've typed him into the Tucker Carlson catalog. Uh, and, uh, you know, a figure like a, a, a gangster rapper who's got uh, some talent for performance and some, you know, sort of critical intelligence about the musical innovation. But he then embodies, he embodies this spirit of defiance. I mean, wouldn't that be a powerful attraction? That posture of permanent aggrievement and of a, of a bald fist and a, and a stand of defiance against the world, the goddamn world that has dealt you this bad hand. So it's human, all too human, uh, what we're seeing. No, no. And I know that's, that's the 101, but that'll never reach me. And it's partly because of just what anybody can see and partly because of some studying that I did 25 years ago that will never, will never leave me, despite the fact that I know nobody will ever engage what I did. But first of all, in Chicago, the idea that it's about opportunity is ridiculous. Show me that there are no opportunities for those boys, because frankly, there are a whole lot of other boys in that city who are finding opportunity. Maybe they're not going to be CEOs, but the idea that there are no jobs, there's no ladder outside of poverty, ask some of the Latino immigrants in that city whether that's really true. Ask some of the African immigrants whether that's true. And another thing is, if there isn't any opportunity in your neighborhood or in your district, then you take yourself to another one. You get on a bus. You go to some other place where there's opportunity and you get home at the end of the day after a commute. That's what people have done since the beginning of the human species. What he's saying with opportunity is because that word opportunity has taken on a certain flavor. It's plenty of opportunity. He knows it damn well. And you can hear people who live in the inner city saying it. Even Elijah Anderson at UPenn, and he's on the side of Omar, will document in his work people saying, you can find jobs here if you look. William Julius Wilson, too. It's not about opportunity. And then second, what people don't think about is that you have to subject these things to experimentation. And a lot of people are going to say, well, opportunity left when low-skill factory jobs went to the suburbs or China. But that didn't happen in every city. And I did a study of Indianapolis where that never happened in the 50s and 60s to any appreciable extent. And I looked at fire insurance maps, because it's really the only way to learn these things. Fire insurance maps over the years of exactly where all businesses were in the city, year after year after year. And I checked, because it's known in Indianapolis that the factories never left. And I checked. They didn't. I knew where the factories were. I knew where the ghettos were. And I checked black newspapers throughout the 1960s. This was some of the most monotonous work I've ever this done. This is but in one of your books somewhere, isn't it? I, I, I is, somehow remember reading this This is you. Winning, winning the Race, and nobody okay. ever reads this chapter. But is it true that in the 1960s there were no job opportunities for black men? And right when the riots are taking place, it was a little later in Indianapolis, the big one happened in 69, there are in black newspapers, not the newspaper for white people, in the black newspapers, you go to the one ads and there are all these openings, you know, this job, that job. And the most important thing is that it often would say, will train. So no, it isn't that you're only, it's the only these things that middle class white people can do. Will train. It simply wasn't true if you were a black man living in the inner city in Indianapolis in 1969 that there were no jobs for you. And I know it because I know what the want ad said and I know where the factory was and it was often a quick bus ride away from your goddamn house. All of which is to say, now there's certain people thinking he's criticizing black folk. No. I'm saying that there was a new mood in Indianapolis, and I know who created it. I know the names of the preachers. I know the name of the Al Sharpton who was there. His name was Snooky Hendricks, folks. There was a new mood that meant that black men were less likely to take those jobs, and they were not menial, horrible jobs. It was not in a slaughterhouse. These were ordinary working class jobs. There was a new mood. There was a new welfare. And I talked to people white and black 30 years after the fact who explicitly told me that all of this is exactly what happened in that one city that not too many people care that much about if you don't happen to live there. 
That's what happened in Indianapolis. That means that the traditional explanations about the factory moves away and nobody has a job and everybody starts knifing each other doesn't work. Now, I wrote about this in Winning the Race. I wrote about it in detail. I enjoyed pretending to be a historian and sociologist. And nobody gave a good goddamn and they never will. But that means that Omar is not the result of white neglect. It's much more complicated than that. And then, Glenn, I'm done. But then one generation after another (laughs) copy each other. And so Omar thinks that the way to be a man is to behave in a certain way so that in the early 90s, you have black guys shooting each other at what's supposed to be the summer festival of love and commercial entrepreneurship in black Indianapolis. That's the story. So no, I'm sorry. And no respect, no disrespect to Lawan or anybody else, but I do not believe that it's because society doesn't love Omar. It's because of the 60s. Okay, well... (laughs) I have I have to uh, channel the rebuttals that I can hear coming from uh, my friends in the in the world of sociology. I can hear Bill Wilson. He's a friend of mine, retired now from Harvard. Great man. The truly disadvantaged when work disappears. Uh, 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 the declining did significance of race. Uh, you know, these are his books. I can hear Thomas Segru, the distinguished historian. I think he's at NYU now, used to be at the University of Pennsylvania. His book, The Origins of the Urban Crisis, about race and class in post-World War II Detroit, uh, complaining. And I would have to say, and I've heard from him in that vein to an extent, but I don't think that the great Professor Segru, and he's really, I mean, he's head and shoulders above me, but I don't think he's read my chapter in Winning the Race. He doesn't know where I'm arguing from. Just well, right. What I was going to say about Segru is I think he would, uh, as I recall the introduction to his uh, great book, The Origins of the Urban Crisis, say that it's a kind of dialectic thing that culture and structure are not, you know, one arrow pointing at the other direction, but that it's a kind of back and forth kind of thing. And the story that he tells about Detroit is really very nuanced. And it doesn't begin in 1969. It begins in 1945, you know. And and the the transformation of the industrial uh, Rust Belt uh, archipelago uh, from Pennsylvania on through Wisconsin and and Iowa and whatnot that's going on at that time in the decades after the Second World War, how the arsenal of democracy, the Motor City becomes, you know, the Detroit that we know today. It's it's complicated. It involves all kinds of stuff like the European resurgence and global trade and the Japanese and stuff like that about union management relations, about American domestic politics and uh, whatnot. And, you know, the, the local political culture of Detroit had a very racially tinged aspect to it. You know, the blacks who had come up in large numbers after the Second World War were encountering East European immigrant communities that were very resistant to their penetration It was before the Civil Rights Act in 1964, well before it. So a lot of the practices of exclusion in terms of employment opportunities were very much working to the disadvantage of Blacks, stuff like that. All of that's true. And let me just say this, John, and and that's Thomas Segru, the dialectical relationship between culture and structure and not a sort of straight line thing. The jobs went away and then Omar. But... uh, um, For uh, Bill Wilson, he's going to say it's not just jobs that went away. He's going to say the concentrated poverty, the truly disadvantaged, this is his book, you know, the the middle class blacks moved away. Middle class argument, yeah. You know, and and suburbanization and and whatnot. And it left these communities that were sites of multiple overlapping uh, dimensions of disadvantage uh, and, and so on. So, you know... With, with great respect to your work in Indianapolis, these guys are still, you know, still going to have an argument uh, with you about, about, about all of that. I do not agree with that business about the middle class moving away. I understand where Wilson gets that. It's intuitive. But the idea that when poor people are all together and there aren't any school teachers or judges around, that everybody is at each other's throats and girls start having children at 12, I don't think that follows. It really doesn't represent the way poverty works, including in a great many very poor communities in the United States. I, I think that, um, you do think, you do think that the expansion of welfare in the sixties had something to do with girls having babies at 14 or 16. I don't know about 12. 
I think that's got to be very rare. But 16, not so, not so <laughs> rare. The question would be, why would it not have? Yes, of course. And it's not doesn't mean that it's some, that there's something wrong with black women folk. It means that a policy came down that was well-intended but had unfortunate side effects. And as far as Sugru, I'm sincere in saying that. I mean, I loved the Detroit book, and I came away from it thinking the problem with this is nothing he explains can account for the extremity of what happened. None of that explains, as you just said, Omar. What he talks about would create a shabby community kind of holding on by its fingers, but not the the extreme violence, not that wave of people giving birth very young, which has interrupted. And so if you want to make that all about the GNP and racism, notice that that's no longer the big problem it was. But for 30 years, it was that complete community breakdown where people, there's even one ethnography where one woman says, it's actually from Jason DeParle's book, um, American Dream, about welfare recipiency and how it changed in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. One woman, one black woman actually says, it seems like in 1971, everybody just about lost their minds. That's what she actually says. And it's true. And why? It's not because there's something wrong with black folk. That's not what I'm saying. But something was different then. And it wasn't that you couldn't get a job. She, even that same person, the character's character person, is named Angie. He gives her the name Angie. And she says it wasn't a lack of jobs. She said there are plenty of jobs. She says it was something else. And that's as far as I think a person living on the ground can, can get. But something was in the air then. And that's what I can't get away from. Well, what was in the air, as I recall, because I was, I was there. You were six years old, John. <laughs> But I was 23. I'm making all in this 1971. Up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and what was there was Vietnam and uh, a sense of radicalism in rejecting the American military industrial complex, imperial machine, anti communist crusade, a kind of, you know, I mean, I was reading France Fanon, you know, Wretched of the Earth, Black Skin, Many White Mask. Were. You know, I, and and uh, Che Guevara was actually an interesting, you know, figure. I mean, it, it was somebody that you would take, you know, the, 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 the Cuban Revolution, when I was, you know, coming along, uh, had a, a, a visceral attraction to, to people in the kind of progressive sphere of African-American intellectual uh, whatever. So... I don't know. That was one thing that was going on. Another thing that was going on was the counterculture. It was sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It was it was women's liberation and the pill and 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 uh, a kind of countercultural, you know, uh, revulsion at at nor normalcy. You know. Yeah. Do you, do you know Philip Ross' uh, novel American Pastoral? I I, I love I that know novel. It, I know it well, and that's an example. Captures yes, what was going on in 1971. <laughs> that horrible daughter, right? I mean, yeah, that's exactly. his, his caricature of it. Yeah, exactly. That and that blew over into the black community as well. But Black America, or Black America, was not as poised to deal with it. So that character in American Pastoral can at least attempt to save her. Swede wants to bring her back to the suburbs. But that's not what happens if, if a girl does that in, in, say, August Wilson's Pittsburgh. It's different. And so it wasn't, it, it wasn't as easy to incorporate that kind of fuck everything attitude if you have many fewer resources already. Then you add the new welfare, which was intended as a favor. Then you add a war on drugs that starts sending people to jail and gives a temptation to work off of the legal market bigger than it had ever been before. And of course, to me, yeah, the, the, the result of that is Omer. But it's not just that the Coca-Cola factory moves out to the suburbs. That's, that's just not enough. And I have seen you writing back then that that's not enough. You wrote a very civil piece where you were saying that the literature does not support the idea that deindustrialization must be as important as people are saying it is. I forget when you wrote it, but you wrote it. I remember reading it. All right. Well, I don't know, John. I think we've gotten ourselves in enough trouble for uh, for Let's the better part Tucker, of an hour. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and we have our, our work cut out for us uh, further on in the day. So I don't know. Want to call it a wrap? That 
Fantasia from one thing Tucker Carlson wrote. I think we can call it. We can call it a wrap. Yes. <laughs> what will happen to Tucker? We could speculate about that. What 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 do you imagine? Your ear to the ground oh. there in New York City. Do you have any any idea about what comes next? No, but I mean he'll he'll you know with modern technology he can continue to be a voice and many many people will listen to him. It'll never be quite the same, but oh he'll. He'll land on his feet, you know, hold up in that bunker of his. You know, he's he, he's not gone. He'll be fine. And he'll keep saying that same stuff. Let's not but cry for Tucker Carlson, who'll what, what probably do, you call do it? okay. You know, mm-hmm. well into eight figures, as far as I can tell. So when you when you interviewed with him, yes. what 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 kind of guy did he seem like? I interviewed with him 20 years ago before he was Tucker Carlson, and he seemed like a, a bow-tied Federalist Society nerd. That's what Well, I there wasn't a bow-tie, but there was this kind of cherubby-like, uh, you know, demeanor, this kind of, uh, you know, he was not a jock in high school, you know, kind of thing. Bright, uh, almost giggly at, at certain points when he was amused, uh, but also very tough-minded, very, very you know— the guy's on a mission, you know. He, he, but uh, what I wanted to say as we're closing out here to the audience is become a paying subscriber to glennlowry.substack.com. If you are seeing this video, you can be seeing it without being a paying subscriber. You can just be a subscriber, or you could have just stumbled upon me at YouTube or uh, whatever. But if you become a paying subscriber, you become a part of the family here and make sure that we keep telling the truth about the world as we see it, regardless of whatever winds might blow adversely in terms of cancel culture and stuff like that. So <clears throat> become a paying subscriber to The Glenn Show. I urge you. <laughs> <laughs> End of commercial. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, John, for putting up with that, my man. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Glenn. All in good fun. <laughs> All right.